Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Michael Newman, Chief Executive of the Association of Jewish Refugees. And thank you very much for joining us for this special event as we mark the 60th anniversary of a watershed moment in post-war history, the capture and bringing to justice of Adolf Eichmann. Eichmann was the chief architect of the Holocaust, charged with managing and facilitating the mass deportation of Jews to ghettos and killing centers in the German occupied East he was responsible for the implementation of the Endlösung, the final solution that was planned at the Wannsee Conference of January 1942. Following his stunning abduction by the Mossad in Buenos Aires on 11th of May 1960, Eichmann's trial in Jerusalem that began on the 11th of April 1961 sparked international interest and heightened public awareness of the crimes of the Holocaust. The televised trial reached a global audience and gave a platform for survivors to share their testimony and for the world to hear the harrowing truth of the atrocities Eichmann and his collaborators perpetrated. The impact of the trial continues to have resonance today and reminds us all of the need to uphold the truth of the Holocaust. To commemorate this landmark event, the Association of Jewish Refugees, the AJR, and 3GNY are delighted to bring together an internationally acclaimed panel to discuss the capture of Eichmann, his prosecution, the impact of the trial in Israeli society, and the legacy and lessons of the trial for today. The Association of Jewish Refugees is the national organization in the United Kingdom that represents and supports Holocaust survivors and refugees and their families. Alongside our primary objective to deliver social and welfare services, something that has taken on a new dimension this past year, the AJR is developing our activities to engage with the next generations. The AJR is also a leading benefactor of Holocaust educational and commemorative projects and programs. In this, our 80th anniversary year, we are thrilled to be launching two special commemorative and educational projects that reflect our strong commitment to preserving the legacy of the refugees and survivors. As we move from living to documented history, our mission is strengthened by connecting the resources we are building so that this and subsequent generations can engage and interact, not only so that they can challenge Holocaust denial and distortion, but also perpetuate their family story. I'm Kel White, a 3G New York board member and grandchild of Sala and Avram Kurtz, two survivors from Radom, Poland. And I'm so proud to be here on behalf of 3G New York grandchildren of Holocaust survivors. I am delighted to be partnering with the Association of Jewish Refugees and ANU, the Museum of the Jewish People, on this event, and honored and grateful to be in the presence of these illustrious panelists on this discussion. 3GNY is an educational nonprofit for grandchildren of survivors and our supporters. As a living link, we preserve the legacies and the lessons of the Holocaust. Our mission is to educate diverse communities about the perils of intolerance and to provide a supportive forum for the descendants of survivors. 3GNY is most proud of our flagship educational program, We Do, which is short for We Educate. This initiative empowers grandchildren of survivors to learn and compellingly share their family's Holocaust experiences in school classrooms and with community groups. Since We Do started in 2010, we've trained more than 250 speakers, visited 300 classrooms in 90 different schools, and have reached more than 25,000 students. For a long time at 3GNY, we noticed that there were major gaps in the knowledge of our fellow 3Gs with regards to pivotal historic events, such as the Eichmann trial. It is our mission to educate our members as well as the general public. And it was almost inconceivable that our, our speakers were going into classrooms to talk to students about the Holocaust without a sense of context or of the major players who shaped and carried out the final solution and who need to be held accountable regardless of their current age and state of health. This is why what we are doing is so critical. And it punctuates the, the week of Yom HaZikaron and Yom HaAtzma'ut, where we can feel additional pride in Israel's accomplishments, including this trial that captivated the world and projected a new image of strength and self-determination. I'm now delighted to introduce James Lipson to moderate this event and chair the panel. James is the managing partner at Mishkondere Solicitors. He's a litigator who acts mainly for individuals and families 
in global commercial disputes and employment and reputation matters. Most relevantly in connection with this event, James acted for Deborah Lipstadt in her defense against the defamation case brought by David Irving in 2000. James, the AJR and 3GNY deeply appreciate you taking the time to moderate this event. And I pass the microphone over to you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you also to AJR for arranging this event. As it's a real privilege to be moderating it and to be amongst such august company. The chance to mark the 60th anniversary of the trial could hardly come at a more urgent time, as Cairn and Michael have both said, in the consideration of the Holocaust and its current resonance. We're coming to the end of the era when we can turn to first-hand survivor testimony and can now appreciate, 60 years on, the foresight demonstrated by Tamar's father to start a process by which the evidence for and the memory of the Holocaust has been captured. Last week, I taught a class with Deborah Lipstadt about the, her trial. And one of the key themes that emerged from the questioning was the extent to which Holocaust denial occupies such a prominent position in so many of today's conspiracy theories. Tamar, who we're going to hear from in a minute, her father Gideon would have been concerned that the foresight he demonstrated to adduce the evidence of so many survivors has not guaranteed the inviolate status of the Shoah. This is one of the many themes that we will explore over the next hour in our conversation later. First, however, I'm going to introduce our panel and ask each of them to make some preliminary remarks focused on their connection to the Eichmann trial. So going around the panelists, who I hope you can all see, uh, first we have Tamar Hausner-Rave, who is the daughter of the chief prosecutor of the Eichmann trial, Gideon Hausner. Tamar witnessed the preparation for the trial from a unique perspective as her father interviewed the survivors in their home. Tamar has said, it left an inventing impression on me. Later on, during and after the, the trial, our home became like a refuge for survivors who saw in my father their voice and representative. Next, we have Ellie Rosenbaum. Ellie is the longest serving prosecutor and investigator of Nazi criminals and other perpetrators of human rights violations in world history, having worked on these cases at the US Department of Justice for nearly 40 years. Under his leadership, the US Justice Department program has won more World War II Nazi cases over the last 30 years than have the law enforcement authorities of all the other countries of the world combined. The most recent such victory was the February 2021 de deportation to Germany of a former Nazi concentration camp guard. Avner Avraham is a renowned expert on Mossad operations who discovered the original documents surrounding Eichmann's capture and moved to share his findings with a wider audience through the Museum of the Jewish People at Beit HaFutzot and their exhibition on the, uh, on the findings. And finally, Shulamit Bahat is the CEO of ANU, the Museum of the Jewish People, formerly known as Beit HaFutzot, in America a global institution which tells the ongoing and extraordinary story of the Jewish people. She attended the Eichmann trial whilst an officer in the IDF. The trial, she said, transformed me from an Israeli sabra to a global Jew. It etched in my mind and heart the darkest chapter of Jewish and human history. Shula was responsible for the groundbreaking Beth Hufusot um, exhibition we just mentioned, which is called Operation Finale, the capture and trial of Adolf Eichmann which en enabled a wide audience to understand the uniqueness and importance of the capture and trial of Eichmann in America recently, and we've just learned it's coming back to Israel uh, in due course when it can be shown. And Shula and I worked together on the Lipstadt trial, which actually took place in 2000, and 2000 so it's uh, 21 years ago now. So it's lovely to be reacquainted with Shula on this panel. So thank you all. Um, as I said, it's a real privilege to be in your company. Lovely to meet you, which I've just done. And I'm going to start with uh, Tamar, and, I, and, and I'd like to hear from you, Tamar, a little bit about your recollections um, of the trial uh, and how it's affected you in your life. Okay, uh, as you recall, on May 23rd, 1960, David Ben-Gurion, our prime minister then, took the stand 
the Knesset and announced a very dramatic announcement that Adolf Eichmann was kidnapped by the Mossad in Argentina. He is now in Israel and soon will be brought to trial in Jerusalem. Just two weeks before that, our family also experienced a small drama of its own. My father, Gideon, was appointed by the government of Israel as attorney general of the state of Israel. He decided right away that he is going to be chief prosecutor at the trial. And that meant appearing in courtroom every day. It was the first time and the only time I remember that the attorney general in the state of Israel appeared in court every day. Anyway, he gathered our small family and told us that uh, we are going to see very little of him in the near future. And so it really happened. Because, uh, you know, there was the team of the prosecution that they had to form with very distinguished people there. Also, the police formed a special unit there were five units till then. They formed Lishka, they called it Lishka 06. It was the sixth Lishka. And they, they were in charge of gathering documents for the and evidence for the trial and also interrogating uh, Adolf Eichmann. It was a very tough job. You remember it was 1960. No Google, no internet hardly archives, and they had to dig and find all the evidence. My father told us that he decided right away that the Eichmann trial is going to be different than the Nuremberg trials that were based mostly on documents. He wanted the witnesses to be heard and tell in the Israeli court in front of the audience here, and actually the whole world, the horrors they went through during the Holocaust. We have to remember that the guy who was in charge of all the arrangements of transporting Jews, of killing them, of finding solution to the what they called the Jewish problem was Adolf Eichmann. So actually, uh, we really, as I said, we saw very little of him at that time. Uh, and after about a month or two months, started coming, arriving to our home, few people that were potential witnesses at the trial. We'll see uh, in the video, one of them, he, called, he was called Yechiel Binur. He called himself Katsetnik. Katsetnik was the number of a prisoner in a concentration camp. And he was already then a very known Holocaust writer. My father wanted him very much to be heard in court because he had straight direct connection with Adolf Eichmann. When Adolf Eichmann visited one of the concentration camps that Katsetnik was there, I don't know if it was Auschwitz or another one, they told him that uh, there is a Jew here who claims to have a visa to Argentina. You know, it's really cynic too, because Eichmann who was kidnapped in Argentina anyway. Um, so he ordered to bring him that Jew. And when Yechiel Dino was brought there, Eichmann kidnapped his visa, torn it to small pieces and shouted at him, Dirty Jew, you stay here. So, you know, the, the, uh, the, the whole situation was very much, uh, very important uh, to be heard in trial. And that's why uh, my father and the prosecution wanted him very much to come forward and testify. But the you know, told them that he is not going to be a good witness. It, it, he doesn't know if he can take it. So my father invited him to our home with his wife, Nina. And 
My mother prepared tea and coffee and cookies and everything. They closed. We had very, very heavy doors to our living room. They closed them. But of course, me and my younger brother, Amos, we stood behind the door and we listened. And we heard this story. And we heard that he said that uh, he doesn't want to, to uh, testify because the stories that he's going to tell are so unbelievable. The judges will not believe it. Anyway, my father convinced him. And as you see uh, in the video, he came up, he testified in court, but his evidence was rather short. Tamar, that's, that's a fantastic introduction because it gives a real feeling for what it was like uh, in the preparation for the trial. And we'll come back to that. We'll, we'll come back to you uh, later on. But I want to introduce the other panellists as well and make sure that everyone uh, has a chance to speak. Um, so, Ellie, can I turn to you? Um, sure. And, and um, perhaps you could, you could uh, obviously, you, you've had a very, very long career uh, in prosecuting uh, war criminals. But perhaps you could uh, explain for us the... The, the context of the Eichmann trial in that and, and, and how 
uh, important and how it must have featured in the way your, your approach. Um, Certainly. Thank you, James. Um, uh, so, of course, I don't have the firsthand experience with the trial uh, that uh, Tamar does or that, that Chula had. Uh, I'm just a little, just barely too young to have a firsthand recollection of it. But as a young person uh, in the 60s, uh, when I started to learn about the, the, the Holocaust, um, I soon uh, began reading about the, the Eichmann trial. Uh, and I especially remember uh, reading Jacob Robinson's uh, book, and the, and the Crooked Shall Be Made Straight, which um, is, uh, I always say, the antidote uh, to the error-laden um, and misguided uh, work by, um, um, by, by Hannah Arendt uh, uh, and her pieces in the New Yorker magazine. Uh, and in that book, one of the things that struck me was the extraordinary opening statement of the chief prosecutor, Attorney General Hausner, uh, which um, sent a chill up my spine, and it still does. Um, one of the great orations uh, in the history of, uh, of, of, of courtroom litigation. Uh, later, uh, as I um, ended up uh, coming to the Justice Department in, what, uh, in Washington, in what was then a new unit, set up to investigate and uh, where possible prosecute Nazi criminals in the United States, something I've done now for almost 40 years. Uh, I, I continued uh, being a student of, of the trial and um, I'm privileged in my career that I've gotten to know, uh, meet and to know uh, uh, some of the participants, including uh, Attorney General Hausner, uh, whom I met briefly in 1981, but I've also met Gabriel Bach, uh, who's a friend now, the deputy chief prosecutor, Issa Harrell, the head of the Mossad who led the mission, uh, Peter Malkin, who was the Mossad agent who physically took down Eichmann in Argentina and, and helped put him in the car, uh, uh, Mikhail Goldman, uh, Mickey Goldman, Gilead um, in Israel uh, on, uh, uh, in Bureau 06 of the Israel National Police, who um, was part of a team that accomplished something that I, I can say based on my experience building these cases is almost unimaginable. Uh, the Israel National Police working with the prosecution built um, uh, what was in terms of, of a number of fatalities, the biggest single defendant murder trial in history in less than a year, uh, particularly challenging since um, most of the documentary evidence as Tamar indicated was outside the country. Uh, I've also had the privilege of meeting Yehuda Bakon, uh, an Auschwitz survivor who was one of the testifying witnesses. Uh, in our work, one of the things we, we tried to do was um, kind of um, uh, operate under a, uh, a, a sort of a melding of the, the Nuremberg and Eichmann approaches. The Eichmann trial was the first one where witnesses were, were the key to the case, um, uh, or at least a key to the case. Uh, Nuremberg, that certainly wasn't true, uh, uh, where they relied on documents, as Tamara said. In our work, we use both. Lots of documents that we can find uh, and, whenever possible, uh, survivor testimony. Uh, I will close by uh, saying in the, in the case that we tried just last year in Memphis, Tennessee, here in the States, uh, 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 two thoughts come to mind. That was the first case where there were no survivors of it anywhere in the world. Uh, it was uh, involved a, a guard at a comparatively small subcamp of the Neuengamme concentration camp uh, and there were no survivors left. And I have to tell you, I, I went to court uh, with some trepidation, wondering how we were going to reach the judge's heart uh, without having a single survivor in the court. We, we managed it. Um, it was also the first time that I Help present a case, a Nazi case in court in many, many years. And I was a little rusty. And I remember going in to make the opening statement and literally saying to myself, do the best you can, Eli, because you're no Gideon House. Thank you.
Thank you, Eli. Thank you. Um, and again, we'll, we'll come back because it's, it's very interesting to hear uh, about um, how you uh, prosecute these cases and how, how uh, you adduce the evidence and how we uh, memorialize uh, the victims in all the different uh, formats. So we will we'll come back to that. Um, Avna, may I turn to you? Uh, um, yes. And um, the other aspect of uh, the Eichmann trial that fascinates people uh, is the capture. Uh, and obviously, um, in uh, the way in which we have regarded Israel and its bravery uh, and its pluckiness, uh, this was one of the, the key events uh, in, in that. I'm sure for the um, self-awareness of Israel and its people, uh, but also all the Jews in the diaspora and the pride that uh, they took in um, Israel's acts through, throughout its history, but particularly in the early years of its history. So do you want to just give us a little bit of perspective on the operation and, uh, and how it was executed and, and how it was received as well? So um, I retired from Mossad uh, six years ago. I served for 28 years there. And 10 years ago, I made uh, a small exhibition in the Mossad headquarters. Uh, I took all the original uh, objects uh, photographs, uh, maps, all the original items from the operation. And um, I uh, started to meet uh, the people, few of the uh, agents that took part in uh, the operation. Uh, unfortunately, all of them passed away, but I met uh, Rafi Tan, uh, he was the head of the capture unit and Abraham Shalom and uh, Jacob Meidad. And I found out that no one wrote the whole story. Even Israel Real, that uh, was the chief of Mossad, he wrote a book, but um, he, didn't, he couldn't write about everything. And today we can talk about most of the uh, things in the operation. So it was amazing for me. Um, I'm calling myself a second generation. My parents escaped from Iraq, but I feel like a se second generation. And and uh, in the last 10 years, I'm traveling all over the world. I was in Germany, I was in Argentina a few months, I was in the state. I met a lot of people. I met the second generation, third, third generation. And I, can, I, I, think, I, I think that I can talk uh, uh, hours about the capture. For example, when I came with the exhibition to, uh, um, to Miami, uh, I met an um, 87 years old woman that told me that she took part in the operation. And I asked her, what was your part? And she told me, I was the one that developed all the pictures for the Mossad. We lived in uh, Buenos Aires and, and we got a small uh, a Photoshop and, and, and one of the Mossad agents came with the negatives and I uh, developed all the pictures. And after the capture of Eichmann, the head of the Jewish community in Argentina told us we have to escape to Israel. It's very dangerous. And I found out that there is more than 100 people that took part in the operation without knowing. So it's an amazing story that related to an amazing trial and the story of the Holocaust. And I think that our mission, my generation, our mission is to talk about the Holocaust in a different way, in a creative way. And I believe that more than 100,000 people saw the Operation Finale exhibition, and there is also the Hollywood movie. And this, it's a different way to talk about the Holocaust because they, are, they, they don't want to see Holocaust, they want to see a spy. But at the end of the day, they, they can see and they can learn a little bit about the Nazi and the final solution. And it's important for a better world. Thank you, thank you, Avner. That's the, and, and that leads us very nicely uh, uh, onto Shula, Shula and the um, exhibition and her responsibility for the exhibition. But before, but before we get onto the exhibition and and, um, and your view on, on Avner's marks about educating people about the Eichmann trial and the capture and the, uh, the Holocaust, uh, I, I, I read a quote in the introduction of, of, of your experience of being a, a soldier at the trial. What, what's your recollection? Well, I, I think I was in many ways connected to the Eichmann trial 
from my birth. I was born on January 22, 1942, two uh, days after the 1C conference was completed, where the final solution was determined and later on executed. But it actually began even before my connection to the trial and to the Holocaust began uh, with my parents, uh, who were Zionists. Uh, my father, Mordechai Hochberg, uh, arrived in Israel in 1936, and my mother, Chava Schwarzman, arrived on, on uh, September 1, 1939, as an illegal immigrant. Mm. So all my life, I heard about the Holocaust. I heard about the people that my parents lost, friends, relatives, etc. Only one person from my mother's uh, family survived. And my parents actually consider themselves survival just because they were able to be, to come to Palestine, did not actually diminish their sense of survivor. And so I felt I, and when I was in Jerusalem uh, as, a, as a, an officer and heard about the trial and could not get in, there was in, it was impossible to get in. I went to my commander who happened to be a Holocaust survivor. And I said to him that as an education officer, this relates to the whole notion of education, it is my role to go to the trial. And he said to me, and I told him that my, my, my life story, my parents' story actually. And he said to me, when I'll go, you will go. And I went to the trial when Katsetnik Yechil Dinu collapsed after a few minutes uh, on the stage uh, and that event I will never forget. It really changed me totally. It transformed me completely. No longer did I look uh, to people, including my parents, as representative of this Gola, uh, but I looked at them in many ways as heroes, as people who were part of a very important chapter of Jewish history and human uh, uh, history. The exhibition of Beta Futsot, where I have been working for the last 10 years, really connected, brought all of the threads of my life with regard to the trial and with regard to the Shoah together. And I agree with Avner that it, it was a different way of showing what has happened during the Shoah. And to sit at the display at the, of the exhibition of the trial, I, I'm shivering even as I'm speaking about it now because I really felt I was going back to Bet Ha'am during the trial itself. That a, 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 a exhibition gave, and I'll talk a little bit more about it if you would want to later on, but that exhibition was my platform to continue to educate anyone I came across with and to create programs related to the Holocaust, related to the whole notion that a small 12 year old country took upon itself something that was absolutely important and Gidon Hausner represented to pursue justice, not to revenge, but to pursue justice because David Ben-Gurion wanted more than anything else for the people who lived in Israel to build the country and not to think about the destruction of the Holocaust. And I think he succeeded with a trial to accomplish both. So thank, thank you, thank you. And I think uh, going, going around each of you, um, it illustrates um, all, all the aspects of what we want to explore today. The, prosecution of the war crimes, um, how we preserve the memory, um, education, uh, the, 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 the Mossad operation um, as well. Um, I want to ask, just to get the discussion uh, going, um, how successful um, the, 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 you think, it's not just the Eichmann trial, but all the efforts combined of the panel, whether it's through education, uh, whether it's through prosecuting war criminals from the Eichmann trial onwards through uh, other uh, uh, other means uh, that are, the organisations that we're involved in uh, have been in, in, in preserving the memory of the Holocaust uh, have been and what we need to do to carry on doing that and what we can continue to learn from 
the Eichmann trial and the 60 year anniversary. So maybe we can start with you. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I want to tell you that now they are re rebuilding the uh, Beta Am in uh, Jerusalem. And there's going to be one big hall which will be uh, to memorize the Eichmann trial with videos and, and audio video as audio visual. And it's going to be very interesting, very nicely done. It will be, I think, finished uh, in a couple of months. Secondly, I agree that with Avner, that uh, with the Operation Finale and the other series and movies, that's how you really can catch the audience. So the uh, Metro Golden Meyer is having a new series uh, together with the very talented people from Israel, uh, producer uh, Kobe Seat and director uh, uh, Yariv Moser. I don't know if you saw uh, the film Ben Gurion Epilogue, which is a very interesting doco. So he's the one who did it. And uh, they're uh, doing it uh, a very interesting series, which is going to be with very uh, new items, like they have, they put their hands on the recording of Zassen. Zassen was a Nazi journalist who interviewed Eichmann in Argentina. And then Eichmann admitted with everything that he did, including his very famous saying that he will die very happily, jumping to the hall knowing that he will find there are millions of Jews that he killed. So I think it will give a new dimension to the, to the trial in which Adolf Eichmann really denied everything. He did not admit. Thank you. Ellie, do you have a sense of, of, of sort of finishing your work and, and passing over the baton in a, in a different way, some of the ways that we've been exploring here? Yes, I mean, certainly uh, in the year 2021, we are just about at the end point at which um, justice, law enforcement justice can, can be obtained in these cases. We are running up against what uh, Simon Wiesenthal used to call the biological uh, solution to the, the uh, problem of fugitive Nazi criminals. I, I do want to say um, that although the Eichmann trial itself was in so many ways uh, a, an enormous success, uh, a seminal event in, in world uh, jurisprudential history, certainly also in Israeli history, and I would submit Jewish history, um, the rest of the world has not done nearly as well. Uh, and when we look back uh, now, um, we see that the vast majority of the perpetrators of Nazi crimes, uh, including the Shoah, especially the Shoah, uh, went unpunished. They, they, they got away with it. Uh, I wanted to um, uh, bring us back, if I could, um, to um, the uh, milieu of, the, of, of that time, 1960, when Eichmann was captured in 61. Um, younger generations can hardly imagine this, I suspect. Uh, a huge percentage of Israel's population uh, was comprised of survivors and escapees from, from Nazi Europe. Uh, Tamar's brother, uh, uh, Amos, uh, gave a presentation uh, a few years ago in which he said 500,000 of the 200,000 Jews in Israel at that time uh, uh, were survivors or escapees. I, I know that back then, um, and again, hard to imagine, um, if you spoke Yiddish or German, uh, you didn't even need to learn Hebrew. My grandmother who died in Israel uh, in 1963 after the family escaped in the late 1930s to what was then Palestine, never learned a word of, of Hebrew. You didn't need it. Um, it was an environment in which uh, the country was fighting for its life every day, every single day. Um, they had universal military service. And um, uh, the survivors uh, in general did not feel comfortable speaking publicly about their ghastly experiences. Uh, there was the sense that they would be looked down upon. 
for not having uh, fought back as though as though that opportunity was a realistic possibility. It, for the most part, was not. Uh, and the trial changed everything. Uh, the trial was, of course, the first um, uh, trial to be televised live in world history. It was uh, broadcast live in Israel uh, on television and on radio. Um, um, highlights of the trial were made available to broadcasters around the world by uh, ABC Cap Cities. And in many cities uh, in my country, uh, including New York, um, there was a nightly recap, uh, video recap of, of the trial. Um, what that did was, uh, well, it changed history. Um, uh, the survivors spoke out. They were the heroes of that trial, uh, people who were willing to reopen these terrible wounds that can never heal all for the benefit of informing the court and, and the world's public about the horrors of the Holocaust. Uh, and that uh, sort of opening of um, uh, survivor oral uh, history, um, uh, one sees every day in, in uh, uh, classes that survivors address in oral histories that they've given to Yad Vashem and the Holocaust Museum, the USC Shoah Project, and Fortunoff Archive at Yale and on and on and on. Frankly, the building of museums, uh, uh, memorializing the Holocaust uh, uh, outside of Israel and owe everything to, I think, to the Eichmann trial and the courage of, of the survivors. The trial uh, proved that it was possible uh, even after, you know, uh, quite a few years had already elapsed uh, to obtain justice uh, uh, and that a, um, a trial in Israel of a Nazi criminal could be held fairly. The court and the prosecution did a great job of ensuring that Eichmann's rights were respected at all times. Uh, it showed that a, uh, an invaluable historical record could be built in the course of, of a trial. Uh, and in my uh, 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 office, uh, we have actually used some of the uh, uh, captured Nazi records that were amassed by the the prosecution team. And I would uh, finally say uh, from a historical perspective that the Eichmann trial revived flagging interest around the world in the Holocaust itself uh, and in the possibility of pursuing justice. There was very little of it being done by the time Eichmann was, was apprehended. And in the wake of that trial, you saw a revival of prosecutorial interest, especially in what was uh, then West Germany uh, led in particular by Fritz Bauer, the German Jewish prosecutor who, who was the driving force in the uh, Auschwitz trial of the mid 1960s and was also, of course, the man who pressed the Mossad, um, the Israeli government, uh, to, um, to bring Eichmann uh, to Israel. May I suggest, say something about this subject? Of course, of course. And I'd like to hear a little bit if you can weave it in because Eli spoke about the milieu at the time, and, I, and I'd like to hear a little bit about the milieu and, and how uh, the trial was received, particularly in Israel at, at, at the time. But, but say what you wanted to say, Sheila. Well, what I, I wanted to speak about is the whole concept of Bechol Dor Vador, Chayav Adam Lirot Et Atzmo, Ke'ilu Hu Yatsa Mimitzrayim. In each and every generation, we have to see ourselves as if we left Egypt. The issue of Egypt was all lights and shadows. Uh, we went from slavery to be free people and to be people. And I think the whole the Holocaust has to be presented not just from about the Shoah, but also about the Tkuma. I have three grandchildren. And in the Haggadah, which we of course read every year, we also talk about the Holocaust. We also talk about the Inquisition. We talk about all of those historical milestones that they need to know about because it's part of their history. And I think it's quite important to, to uh, tell the story all the time. And as Avner said earlier, it's not just the story of East European Jews. It is a story of Sephardi Jews as well because they were in Macedonia and they were in Bulgaria and they were in, in uh, Greece, and they were in North Africa. There are so many aspects of that story. 
that are not known and have to be known. So it's our responsibility, whether it's through films or through exhibitions or through our telling uh, stories. I, I tell my three grandkids, do you want to hear a real life story? And I weave into those real life stories, real stories of their grandparents, uh, of myself. And you know, I, of course you have to tie the story, to adapt the story to the age group of people, but we have to continue to tell the story in many, many different ways, not just about the victims of the Holocaust, but also those who fought the Nazis, those Germans, by the way, who came out of that experience loving Israel and loving Jews, there are so many dimensions to it that we have to address and could address after, unfortunately, all of the survivors, those who actually went through the experience, will be gone. And we are very close to that uh, uh, date. It's really interesting to hear you talk about uh, the Shoah in terms of the Inquisition and, the, uh, and us leaving Egypt. Uh, because we really are coming to the moment where we move from it being a contemporary experience to a historical experience. Uh, and it feels to me uh, that for all the currency and for all the fact that it's, it, it's a much more recent historical experience than the other ones that we think about uh, through our traditions, uh, that it is in some sense uh, a little less certain. People don't question the fact of the Inquisition. People don't question the fact that we left Egypt. Uh, and yet people are questioning the, the, um, the, the, the show up. Uh, and I wonder if, if, if any of you have some observations on, on, on that. And, and as we pass through this very, very delicate time, uh, what we can do to, to combat that. If I may, I think the enormity of uh, this evil, the incomprehensivity of it, I mean, it's impossible to wrap your arms around it. And the fact that it is still current history, it's history of the 19th, the 20th century, I think make it, uh, may make it a little bit more difficult to uh, accept. I can tell you my older grandson who is going to be bar mitzvah in September keeps asking me, why do the Germans hate the Jews so much? And every year I'm giving him yet another uh, answer that is suitable for his knowledge and his uh, understanding. I think we have to constantly think about how to bring the subject and, and also how to bring the whole notion, not just of the Shoah, but of Retzach Am, the genocide of other people uh, to the fore. Uh, it's important, and I can tell you in Better Food Thought, uh, what used to be the Better Food Thought and is now Anu, it's not a Holocaust museum and there is no need for another Holocaust museum in Israel. We have four of them. But there is a place where people can, a, 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 it's a spiritual space where people can read a poem about the Holocaust and can reflect about it in silence. So we have to find different ways and different platforms to continue to tell the story so that it would not happen again and it would not be forgotten. If I may, I want to, James, just to add something. I think that now after, I, I think Shula is very right and we have to hurry because I think now after the uh, coronavirus, I believe that antisemitism will increase in the world. And the part of it uh, is the denial of the Holocaust, which you're an expert on that. And uh, that's why we have to do whatever we have to do, whatever was suggested here, as soon as possible. We don't have much time. If I could add something uh, as well, um, on Holocaust denial, um, a bit of perspective, at least in my view, never, has so much time and effort been put into convincing the world uh, of, uh, of a fact, or in this case of a non, what they claim is a non-fact, the, the Holocaust, with so little success. Doesn't mean we don't have to keep fighting, but um, the reality of the Holocaust is well established. The, and it was established primarily, that is to say the heavy lifting was done by the survivors themselves in their public speaking, in their recorded testimonies, uh, in their memoirs, in their books, 
in their presentations to classes um, uh, throughout the free world. I uh, would also say that uh, prosecutors uh, have played an important role in this, starting at Nuremberg, where they proved uh, the, the, the mass murder of 6 million uh, Jewish civilians, uh, uh, primarily through documents, but also through the testimony of two, two survivors. Um, and then uh, filmed the, almost the entire trial, audio recorded the trial, uh, uh, archived all of the evidence, and then sent to depository libraries all over the world uh, copies of the, uh, of the documents that, that were used. Uh, that tradition, so to speak, was also followed uh, in the Eichmann trial. Um, uh, the trial was completely video recorded, uh, audio recorded, and the documents are maintained in Israel. And then they were, uh, the entire trial record was published in English uh, in, a, in a multi-volume set, the last of which has a microfiche of all of the evidence, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, uh, in, in our office have, have tried to emulate what was done at Nuremberg and in the Eichmann trial uh, by donating all of our uh, trial transcripts, more than 50,000 pages, completely in English, uh, to the United States Holocaust uh, Memorial Museum. If I may, uh, if I may add something about credibility. I remember myself coming in uh, Manhattan to the to our exhibit with, with, uh, with kids, and you have to explain to them why we need the flight tickets. Why, why, we, have, why we have to develop picture and wait a few days to develop the pictures. And I also remember when we made the Operation Finale a movie, uh, I, I was a few months in Argentina, and I remember there is a scene that uh, Sir Ben Kingsley, playing Eichmann, holding a list of trains. And they just made a random list of places. And I told the director, give me a few hours. I will check with Yad Vashem, and I'm going to bring you the real trains, the whole list. And, uh, and they said, okay, do it. And when you see the movie and you see him holding a list of trains, it's true. And I remember also that there is a scene with a waiter in a restaurant. And uh, I remember the head of the makeup department told me, Avner, can you make a number? Just give me a number, you know, for, for, the, for the arm. I told him, I'm not going to give you a number. I'm going to give you a real number. I will take it from a Holocaust survivor. And she told me, you need a contract. We need a contract from the family. I said, you will have a contract from the family. And when I got the number, I gave them the number and it started with A. And they told me, how come it started with A? And I checked again with Yad Vashem and they told me the Nazi gave the A before the number for May 44. And this Holocaust survivor was from Budapest. And, uh, and, and for me, it was also a, a different way or a new way to fight against the Holocaust deniers. I, I, I'm a little, uh, I'm perhaps a little less sanguine than uh, um, Eli is in, in, in terms of the, the, the danger, because I think um, denial, Holocaust denial lurks under the surface of so many uh, conspiracy theories, uh, and we see it as a, an absolutely key aspect of the credo in, in so many of the conspiracy theories and anti-Semitic um, movements uh, that we witness around the world. My last experience of fighting anti-Semitism has been representing the Jewish labor movement in this country uh, in its fight against the anti-Semitism that unfortunately took over a large part of our Labour Party. Uh, and there, um, lurking beneath um, the anti-Semitism and the anti-Israelism um, was uh, Holocaust denial in some aspects, uh, aspects of it. Uh, and we were very close uh, to a political party in this country uh, that was fueled to a degree uh, by anti-Semitism and by Holocaust denial uh, being in power here. And we saw uh, anti-Semites and Holocaust denial, uh, deniers uh, on the doorstep of the Capitol building uh, in, the, uh, in the riots last year or earlier this year. Uh, and so my fear is not about the way in which the theory has succeeded and established itself, uh, but the way in which it fuels other dangerous uh, aspects in our dangerous aspects in our society. Important observations. 
Um, I agree. We must carry on fighting all of us. Absolutely, every day. Um, the 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 um, I'm interested also. We, uh, it's been mentioned a few times about uh, the portrayal uh, of the trial, uh, the films. There was the, the there was the TV, uh, uh, the, the BBC uh, program as, uh, uh, as well. Um, perhaps particularly with uh, uh, Tamar, who, who who experienced it in real time. What, what what have you thought about the portrayals of the trial, the the fictional portrayals of the trial? Have they have, have they been good representations? I just I just saw the BBC one, the Eichmann show. I was not very much impressed, I must tell you. It was mostly about uh, the press and uh, how they took it. By the way, if we're talking about the press, I want to tell you that uh, there were more than seven hundred uh, journalists and media from all over the world. And after the week that uh, only legal arguments were heard in court, some of them, many of them said they're going back home. It's so boring. Why did they come here? And, and thanks God they stayed to hear the opening speech. I think the, uh, the legal arguments that uh, Servatius raised, like uh, that we don't have the legal authority because he was kidnapped and that uh, Israel was not existing then and it's retroactive and extraterritorial. And a very interesting also argument that uh, how can we expect Jewish court to judge uh, a, a criminal against Jewish people. Anyway, it took almost a week till the court came with a decision that he denied all these uh, arguments. And uh, then only then the uh, trial began. But I don't know any other uh, doko which were really made about uh, the whole trial. The evidence, put uh, into the internet here and there, uh, actually the whole trial. But uh, I believe that the new, the new series, which is going to be documentary, I think it's going to be very new and very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, there is an aspect of the trial that uh, we have not talked about yet, and that that was, in many ways, it became a, 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 a psychotherapy uh, to the trauma mm -hmm. that people went through. And I was thinking about it when my mother died and she died, you know, symbolically on Yom HaShoah. Uh, she spent as much time crying about her family that was lost as she was looking for a, a survivors and telling us about the good times in, in the shtetl uh, or the city that she was, she was growing up. But she never had the opportunity to really uh, deal with professionals in the field of trauma. None of, none of that, uh, uh, that generation, those who survived the actual uh, uh, concentration camps and those who survived the, the loss of their family really went through dealing with their own feelings. And the trial in many ways opened up that kind of, of a, a treatment. A, and the treatment was in the end in speaking about the Holocaust, in speaking about the experience that people went through. And that was part of the importance of, of uh, 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 the Holocaust. And I often ask myself, how come there was only one trial in Israel? There was, an, uh, later on, there was the Myanmar trial, but there was only one trial of a major Nazi operative. That was the decision actually of David Ben-Gurion because he did not want the, the population in Israel, those who went through it and those who did not go through it to uh, be, focusing on, on the destruction. He wanted to focus on the construction of a, a, the Jewish state. But I'm wondering if there would have been another trial and if there other people would have been, as you suggested, uh, Eli, 
many people have not really tried. I mean, many of them, many of the criminals died and they would never saw a, a, a prison. Yeah. And I'm wondering what impact it would have had on Israel if there were more trials. I, I feel now, years later, I feel that the decision that, uh, uh, that David Ben-Gurion and the government actually took was in a way a right decision for a country that was only uh, 12 years old at the time. I can add something about Mengele. Uh, I found in my research that the Mossad uh, found the address in uh, Buenos Aires and the head of Mossad came to the safe house during the, ten, the long 10 days they held Eichmann there. And he told uh, the head of the capture unit, Rafi Etan, let's bring Mengele together with Eichmann. And he told him, are you crazy? Our mission is to bring only one Nazi for one trial. So he said, okay, let's wait. I will land with Eichmann in Israel and I want three of the agents will stay in South America. And the mission is to find and bring Mengele to Israel with the Zim ship, with the big ship that came to Argentina. And uh, I can tell you for sure, since Ben-Gurion made this announcement on May 23rd, 1960, too early, if you ask me, it was too early. Three Mossad agents were far away from home. And I believe that he didn't know. I think that the head of Mossad didn't tell him that we are going to bring and find and bring Mengele to Israel. I believe that they didn't want to tell him. And I can tell you also for sure that Ben-Gurion didn't want the Mossad to deal with Nazis. He didn't want to hang all the Nazis in Jerusalem. It was enough for him to make one big trial. I cannot say anything good about Eichmann, but the only thing that was good about him, he was a good example because he was the architect of the Holocaust. Uh, Adam, yeah, while, while, while we're in Argentina, you've taken us to Argentina, uh, just, uh, just, just add a little bit more of sort of color to the actual, opera actual operation. Uh, Ellie said earlier, uh, milieu. Uh, what, what, what was what was communicate some of the tension in, uh, of the operation to us and, and and how it happened. So Ben Gurion didn't order to, to to find and bring Eichmann. It was a love story between a half Jewish girl and with, and between Eichmann's son. Uh, Eichmann came to Argentina on 1950. The family joined him, uh, the wife and three kids after two years on 52. And they decided to keep the name Eichmann. And one day, the half Jewish girl, Sylvia Herman, met Eichmann's son in a cinema. It was a love story. And one day, her new boy, uh, boyfriend came and uh, met her father, Lothar Herman. And Lothar Herman said, uh, start to ask questions. And uh, Klaus Eichmann uh, uh, spoke about, he thought it's a German Nazi family. And uh, Lothar Herrmann uh, realized that it's uh, probably Eichmann's son. He sent the information to the famous prosecutor until today, uh, Dr. Fritz Bauer. And uh, he was a, a Holocaust survivor and uh, the chief prosecutor in Frankfurt. And he decided to give this information, uh, to send this information uh, to the Mossad. And uh, and the Mossad didn't want to, um, to send agent to check at the beginning, to check the information. It was, I think, 57, 58. But they knew that there is a police officer that coming to a, a conference, to an Interpol conference in Argentina. And uh, the head of Mossad asked him if he can check the house in Chacabuco Street, not Garibaldi, Chacabuco Street. And the agent, and, and he said, no way that Eichmann will live in this poor neighborhood. So that's why we lost two years. Only after Fritz Bauer came to Israel uh, on 59 with additional information and with the name, with the fake name, uh, Ricardo Clement. Ricardo Clement was the name uh, in, the, in the fake passport that the Vatican gave to Eichmann and to more and to other thousands of Nazis that escaped to Argentina. If I could add, um, uh, again, from an American perspective, uh, 
to, to give a sense of what a remarkable accomplishment this was. Um, we now have um, the records of the CIA pertaining to Eichmann, and I remember seeing them just before we released them to the public. And there are some extraordinary uh, communications uh, reflected in the documents. Um, one of the Mossad's accomplishments in this was they kept it completely secret, so secret that even the CIA uh, didn't figure out what the Israelis were up to. And when uh, Eichmann's capture was announced by uh, Prime Minister Ben Gurion in the Knesset and was front page news all over the free world, uh, no one was more amazed than Alan Dulles, the legendary a CIA director who had been a, a leading OSS official for the United States during World War II. And you can actually see the documents uh, reflecting his uh, personal interest in finding out how on earth this little underdeveloped country could have um, uh, uh, located Eichmann and captured him thousands and thousands of miles away in Latin America. They were desperate to know and a, a CIA officer contacted his opposite number at the Israeli embassy and took him on a car ride uh, around Washington, uh, completely devoted, uh, A, to congratulating uh, him, and B, uh, mostly, to trying to get some details of how it was done for <laughs> Alan Dulles. Uh, just an, an, an amazing, amazing accomplishment. And again, for a, a younger uh, audience, uh, you can hardly imagine um, what a giant news story Adolf Eichmann was. Front page headlines for the uh, duration of the period from his capture until his execution. Uh, and were it not for the fact that the Soviets put the first uh, human being in space the same day uh, that Eichmann was uh, captured, basically, uh, it, it would have been the number one story in the world. And but for the Nuremberg trial, uh, this would have been uh, the trial uh, of the century. If I can quickly pick up on something that uh, Shula Bahat said, um, the fact that the vast majority, well, first of all, Israel uh, could not fairly be asked to be the dumping ground for all the surviving Nazi criminals. The obligation to bring them to justice was a European one, uh, pr principally uh, Germany and Austria, where most of the perpetrators remained after the war, had that uh, uh, obligation. And the fact that most of the perpetrators got away with it um, um, is, is a tragedy and the responsibility lies principally uh, in uh, the governments uh, of, of Germany and, and Austria. It's a, a sad reality, uh, but- uh, Following up, sorry. Following up on uh, Ellie's uh, a description of Foster Dallas and his surprise, there was somebody else who was very surprised and that was Abba Ibn who was in Argentina yeah. and his plane, he came to represent Israel uh, in the 150th anniversary of the state of uh, Argentina. And on his plane, Eichmann went back to Israel and he had no knowledge of that. And he was sitting when a, a, um, David Ben-Gurion made the a, a revelation. He was sitting there totally surprised so I think he and Alan Fosodalos probably had a lot to talk about, uh, <laughs> who was surprised more. But it, it is truly, um, I think, you know, I think that aspect of it, the accomplishment uh, is also something that needs to be uh, uh, told. It is a, a very important story. And I don't know that I've seen it, a ch children's story, for example, that speaks about that aspect of it. And I will br bring it up with some publishers here in uh, uh, the United States, because I think it really ca can capture the imagination and can make Jews and non-Jews alike uh, uh, so proud of this particular uh, uh, accomplishment. Uh, I want to add something uh, about uh, other uh, Nazi criminals that were not brought brought to trial in Israel, in the new uh, series, there are a lot of speculations about why Ben-Gurion uh, didn't want it, actually didn't want it. And Mengele was very close, as Avner said, very close to us to, to be 
brought to trial in Israel. You have to remember that on those days, there were a lot of negotiations with Germany, with Adenauer, about the uh, Shilomim. Mm -hmm. And uh, how do you say Shilomim? Reparations. 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 Right. And, uh, and uh, Adenauer addressed Ben-Gurion and told him, please ask Hausner not to mention a few Nazis that are still in our government, mm -hmm. especially one that was very close to him because he was his assistant and advisor by the name of Globke. Globke was also very, very close to Adolf Eichmann a very close advisor of his. And, uh, you know, uh, Adenauer made all kinds of threats. Uh, if you mention him, then here and there, and we really needed the money, as you know. But anyway, my father said, told him, told Berguyon, I mentioned whoever I need to mention. And finally, he did speak about Globke and he did mention him. He just agreed to one condition that Ben Gurion asked him that whenever he refers to Germany, he will say Nazi Germany. In, you know, as if nowadays the new Germany. Anyway, I want also to remark on what uh, Shula said. Very, very important thing is that really the survivors started talking, they raised their heads. They are not shipped to slaughter anymore. I remember there are two family of survivors in our home in Rechavia in Jerusalem. And when the first witnesses took uh, the stand, one of the women, the survivors, addressed my mother and said, we, wanted, we want our wounds to be healed. Why your husband is doing it to us? Why does he remind us all the time? And when the trial was over, she came to her and said, please tell Gideon, thank you. The wounds were open and all the moose, moose came, came, up, came out. So uh, that's just one example why it was so important for everybody, for Israeli society, for survivors, for the whole world. You know, um, I think uh, the world is still awaiting um, a really good documentary on the trial. Uh, but for people who want to um, learn about the trial, there is nothing better than watching the film of the actual the video of the actual proceedings. Um, uh, there are some extraordinarily uh, dramatic and important moments in the trial. Uh, Shula mentioned uh, the, uh, the, the Dinur testimony where he collapsed on the witness stand. Uh, I think of uh, moments like um, uh, Eichmann uh, actually having the audacity to say on the witness stand that I am a victim. He said, I am a victim. Well, uh, Gideon Hauser did not let him get away with that. Mm -hmm. And then there's uh, the famous episode in which Deputy Chief Prosecutor uh, Gabriel Bach uh, elicited the testimony from an Auschwitz survivor about the last time he saw his young daughter. Yeah, with the red, warped, red coat. With the red yeah. coat, which later is the basis of, of this, the famous scene in the movie Schindler's List mm -hmm. and how uh, Bach was not expecting that because he had not had time to interview the witness beforehand and he completely got paralyzed. He couldn't, could hardly breathe. And finally the judges realized what was going on and, and they they ordered that, that a break be right. taken. Since Ben-Gurion has been mentioned a lot, I thought I would just tell one little Ben-Gurion story, which only came out, I think, two or three years ago. Uh, it, it turns out that uh, before, a few hours before he revealed uh, in Israel's parliament and therefore to the world, the fact that Eichmann was found alive, was captured, was in Israel, and amazingly would stand trial, uh, he held an emergency cabinet meeting to tell cabinet. And uh, of course, they were flabbergasted, as the world would be a few hours later. And a lot of them uh, wanted to know, how is such a thing done? One of the cabinet members asked in Yiddish, and I can't do the Yiddish, how is such a thing possible? And the answer was, well, that's what you have intelligence services for. Um, and then uh, another cabinet 
members said, well, you know, we should do something for these Mossad members. We should, we should give them some reward. And the response was, well, here in Israel, we, we don't have, uh, have medals, uh, so we don't have that to give them. And then Ben-Gurion ended that discussion with the following. He said, the reward for a mitzvah is the mitzvah itself. <laughs> and I think yeah. those are words to live by for us all. I, uh, I can share. I can uh -huh. share. Uh, I can uh -huh. share a story. I can share a story when we. I uh, remember with, with Chula, we came for the first time with the exhibition to Cleveland, Ohio, and I met in a secret uh, meeting. I met a woman that told me that her grandfather was the owner of the safe house, the place that the Mossad. Uh, uh, hold Eichmann for 10 days and I told her um, can you give me the address? He said no way I don't want to mention I, want, I don't want you I don't want you to mention me or to and it took like a three, almost three years and after three years I'm finding myself driving with her nephew or no with her cousin and if you, if you saw the movie and if you read the book, the name of the safe house was Tira. Now Tira in English is castle. And when the cousin uh, took me to a, a, a different city and we entered to the city, I saw the name of the city is Castellar. And they said, oh, I know that Israel took the code name from the real name. And then I checked with the book and I found that there is also another city. The name of the city is Moron. And in the book, there is a, a safe house with the name Doron. And then I found Ramos and Ramim. And it's, it's, it was very symbolic for Israel. And there's also a very funny uh, mistake about his fake El Al employee card because uh, he flew to Israel as an engineer that works for El Al. And it was written there that he born in the original uh, um, uh, card from the operation. Uh, he was born in Afula uh, on 1910, but Afula established only on 1925. So it was a funny mistake that today we cannot do it. May I add something that relates to what Tamar said about the dilemma in uh, Israel with regard to the relationship with uh, Germany and Chancellor Adenauer at the time. Uh, actually, David Ben-Gurion uh, had to make a very important decision, a, a decision that will affect the future of uh, Israel or could affect the future of Israel in terms of the reparations and eventually affected Israel's standing in the world uh, with regard to the Cold War, for example. There were lots of aspects that they, David Ben-Gurion needed to take into consideration uh, before deciding to, to really bring, to, to, to uh, permit the operation. Remember, from the moment Eichmann was uh, identified to the moment he, the operation took place, some time has passed. And that time was needed in order to sort out all of the implications of this uh, uh, trial not just on Israel, not just on the survivor and the Jewish community worldwide, but also in Israel's positioning uh, uh, in the world uh, itself. And it was, it was actually in a meeting that we had, a, a program that we had, that is the Museum of the Jewish People and the Museum of Jewish Heritage in New York, that uh, Ephraim Halevi, the ninth director of the Mossad, went into all of these considerations. And I'll be delighted, of course, to share with you a copy of that uh, uh, statement, which is very important uh, to know. Just to, just to add about the reparation, when Dr. Fritz Bauer, and uh, 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 he, he was, of course, in Frankfurt, and he wanted to send this information to the Mossad, he didn't have any contact with the Mossad. So he went to Cologne and to, and to meet the head of the reparation delegation that stayed there in a building. Now, the, the German didn't, didn't understand why the Israeli delegation have so many members because few of them were Mossad agents. One of them, a Holocaust survivor, Micha Maor, and he was the one that entered to 
by midnight to Dr. Fritz Bauer's office and he made a copy of all the SS files that the Mossad used for the operation and, and the prosecutor used uh, uh, during the, during the, the trial. Um, so, so we've just heard so many interesting uh, insights, many of which I've never heard before, stories I've never heard before. Are there any more that you want to uh, tell our audience that they may not have heard before that are relevant to this? So when I'm lecturing um, around the world and I'm talking about uh, the capture and the trial, I'm showing the picture of 11 agents, uh, nine agents, one doctor and one uh, woman that took part in the operation. And if you look at the faces, if you look at the pictures and you can compare the agents, for example, to 11 Japanese or, or 11 Chinese, in our story, the story of the Mossad is the story of the Jewish people. We look different. We came from different places and we have weapons. Our weapons uh, is our languages, okay? So if you look at the 11 agents, all of them came with fake European passports and uh, the Mossad match the languages uh, and the faces to the passports. And this is the story of the Jewish people and the Nazis tried to kill the Jewish people, but we came from all over the world. My parents came from Iraq and most of the uh, uh, Mossad agents that took part in the operation came from Europe. Just uh, only Rafi Etan was the only Tsabar in, 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 in the team. And the fact, even today, that we can send a Mossad agent that his parents came from Germany and he can speak perfect German and he can book hotel with a German name. This is maybe one of our secrets of the Mossad and this is the, the story of the Jewish people. I think that's a very uh, important point, the diversity and the fact that we are really a global uh, people not bound by uh, uh, geographical borders. But I remembered another anecdote that might be of interest and that is the uh, gloves that Zvi Malkin used to capture uh, uh, Adolf Eichmann. Zvi Malkin held to these gloves for many, many years. And one day he came, he was, became an artist and lived in New York for a number of years. And one day he came to visit the studio of a friend of mine, also an artist. And that friend convinced him to take these gloves and to make a sculpture out of them. And that sculpture was made in five different copies. One of them was in uh, uh, the exhibition and I know the owner of the rest uh, copies. So uh, I thought it was an, an interesting sort of anecdote uh, to sort of complete how, how diverse, how intricate, this whole story is, and I'm sure that we have not covered it all. I'm sure I there bought, are lots of other aspects sure. that are not covered. We'll come back. I, I we'll bought come in back an back auction. Here. I bought in an auction, and I have one of the cast. If I could uh, add one, one uh, either unknown or very little known story, um, uh, the trial was very well received in the United States, uh, but there was at least one person who dreaded it. And his name was Otto Albrecht von Bolschwing. Uh, and he had been an aide to Eichmann and had been, um, uh, played a significant role in, in Eichmann's crimes against the Jewish people. Uh, he had gotten to the United States after serving the CIA after the war. Uh, and when Eichmann was captured, he was, to put it mildly, alarmed. And he reached out to the CIA um, and um, I think they shared uh, the concern that he would be, his name might be mentioned by Eichmann during uh, the trial testimony. In fact, von Bolschwing uh, was mentioned at least once in the trial. Uh, eventually, von Bolschwing was prosecuted by my office uh, more than 20 years later uh, because, well, let's just say we found him on our own. No other American agencies told us uh, of his existence. Wow. Wow. Amazing stories. I mean, really amazing stories. Can I 
the, 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 this whole, um, we've, we've, we've come to the end, I think, to, uh, of our time together, but it's been a, a history lesson. Uh, it's been, for a lawyer, a fascinating, obviously, understanding the, the, the trial itself uh, and the repercussions and the lessons that, we, that we've learned. It's been so illuminating. Uh, and I know if that we had a live audience, uh, people would be cheering you to the rafters uh, at the moment. Uh, but it's been absolutely fantastic. Thank you all uh, for incredible memories, uh, perceptions, uh, and so much history, especially in that last 15 minutes of anecdotes and, and things I've never heard before. It's been really, really fascinating. Uh, thank you so much indeed. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. And thank to the panelists and to the organizers for putting yeah. this program together. James, Tammy, Shula, Avner, and Eli, thank you all so much. We truly appreciate you all for contributing your expertise and deep and personal insights into this unique piece of history. It's been our great honor to bring you this event and we'll be equally delighted to welcome you to future meetings. You can find out more about the AJR at ajr.org.uk and please do connect to us on Facebook and Twitter at the Association of Jewish Refugees. On behalf of 3GNY, I would like to thank all of our guests today for making this an unforgettable experience. And I'd also like to thank you, the viewers, for joining us wherever you are located. You have helped to make this a truly international effort. And we would especially like to thank the amazing teams at our partner organizations who work tirelessly to make this happen. And for more information about how to bring 3GNY speakers to your community or to support our critical work, please visit us at 3gny.org. Thank you.